Thank you. Thank you. Just a little anecdote about uh, the first book which I wrote, Opening the Door of Your Heart, is the reason I wrote that is because I'd been giving teachings uh, for many, many years over here in Victoria and in many other places. And there was this one lady came to see me. Uh, she said, unfortunately, she'd gone through a divorce and it was very acrimonious you know, as her life was falling apart in the separation from her husband. And some of you have uh, been through that or close to that. And she told me that she was actually suicidal for a lot of that uh, period. And it was only, you know, coming to listen to some of my talks that pulled her through. And so she told me that these stories which I keep telling, things like opening the door of your heart and the two bad bricks, you should put them in a book so other people can enjoy them and benefit from them. And of course I said, I can't, I'm too busy coming to Melbourne, <laughs> going other places, I can't find the time. I will do it. And a couple of weeks later, she wrote down a few of those stories and gave it to me. And it was so terrible. I realised, <laughs> if you want something done properly, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> she caught me. So I wrote it out myself, but you know what it's like. <coughs> so, writing a book, it's easy to write a thing, but to get a publisher. Even Harry Potter author, J.K. Rowling, she spent many, many times trying to get a publisher and it was always refused. And so people said it's really hard getting anything published. But you know how that book got published? Because in 2014, I came to Melbourne and I gave a talk at this university. And after the talk, a woman came up and said, I enjoyed your talk. If you ever want to publish anything, please let me know. <laughs> and I reached into my pocket and said, here. <laughs> and that was absolutely true. She couldn't believe it, I didn't believe it, it just meant to be, and it happened. And that was 2004, I think, yeah. That's about 13 years, and that is still a bestseller. Just recently, it's really gone sort of gangbusters, as they say, in Germany. And I don't mind sharing this with you. Just a week ago, all the royalties that go to our center in Perth, $70,000 royalties. And that was just from Germany, let alone all the other countries. So that book has gone a really long way. And the reason is, is because it does connect to people, it does touch people, it does, even kids read that, and the kids, they know many of those stories, and it does change their lives as well. So it's amazing that there is a way of communicating. And even though Many of you can see me on YouTube, and many people say, I see you on YouTube, and now I want to see you live. Why? <laughs> Isn't it more comfortable to sit at home and turn on a computer and see me? Which means if you need to go to the toilet, you can just pause, go to the toilet, come back again. You can't do that here. None of you can pause me <laughs> in an auditorium like this. But why is it that people like to come and see it live? Because there's something very different with that personal connection. The up close and personal actually being there. There's something more is actually conveyed when it's face to face, eye to eye. When you're right here, when it's happening. It's why when people just go to a sporting event. You can see it on the TV, but actually being there and taking in the atmosphere 
again, it's something very different. Which is one of the reasons why this personal interaction is so much more powerful than anything you can see through a screen. Even taking photographs, it's not the same as actually seeing with your real eyes. There's more to it. Which is one of the reasons why that even in Silicon Valley, and I was there a couple of years ago, I've got my credentials by having given a talk at Google headquarters in Mountain View. And after giving a talk at Google, I was, they found out I was in the area, so Facebook had to get me as well. So I also got a, gave a talk in Facebook headquarters. You wouldn't believe how many Buddhists are in there. They've got their own Buddhist clubs and meditation rooms. That's why they invited me. And one nice little thing I found out, the postal address, if anyone that does use post these days, of Facebook. Because they built their own campus, they built their own road and they named the road. And you know the postal address of Facebook is number one, Hacker Drive. And that's true. It's a street. It's the only thing on the street, but they call them Hacker Drive. But anyway, that you go to those places but even there was just after they had a big conference in California with all the major IT companies and they called the theme of the conference Disconnect to Connect. And they did that because they realized that personal interactions are something which is so important. And when I was in Singapore recently, one of the people who was picked me up from the airport they had a bandage on their arm. And they said, well, it used to be called tennis elbow. Now it's called texting elbow. <laughs> and it's true, they've been doing so much texting, you get the same injury as people who used to play tennis. And also they were discovering that the kids, the youth, spending so much time looking at a screen that their eyes were, uh, were beginning to fail very young. They were having like, um, ob like eye problems, optical problems. And so Singapore government was encouraging, yeah, you can, can't stop your kids from texting, but at least go out and look at far distances every now and again. Otherwise, your eyes, your vision will start to get impaired. It's not used to just focusing on something so close. You have to see far distances as well. And that is a great metaphor for one of the dangers to seeing just something so close. The bigger picture is something we keep missing. And a simile of that, I like to use similes because you can convey much more you know, in a story than you can ever convey in a theory. Was, and this was an event in my own life. I used so many events in my life and other people's lives to actually to convey these amazing messages. And this was the time when I was, a, a, just before I went to Cambridge, and I got my scholarship when I was only 17, and so I had a whole year free. And so I went to the United States, and that was boring. It's just the same as many other Western countries, but I was always fascinated with jungles. So I went into Mexico and Central America. And while I was there, I heard about these ancient ruins in the middle of the jungle by the Mayan civilization. And they should be separated from the Aztecs were the violent ones. The Mayans, no one knows much about them. They disappeared before the conquistadors came from Spain. All they were left were some relics, great pyramids, paintings, but no one really knew exactly what their culture was all about. So I was fascinated. 
So I decided to make the trek in the jungle. And it was three days from Guatemala City, on the back of trucks, on boats through these jungle rivers, where you would see dugout canoes with Indian families, totally naked. It was just so exciting. Any moment I expected Tarzan to swing through the jungle. That's what it reminded me of. It was uh, indigenous culture, rainforests. And eventually, after going up these rivers and down these mountain tracks, eventually managed to find, after three days of hard travel through the jungle, these great pyramids in the, in the uh, little complex called Tikal in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula. And those were the days, the wonderful days, where you didn't have to pay entrance fees to go in these sites, where there were no souvenir shops, where there were no guards. There was only, when I got there, there was only one archaeologist and me and the whole site, so I could just wander wherever I wanted to go. Total freedom, no guided tours, so you could figure it out for yourself what was happening in these amazing jungle sites. And I was only, ah, oh, I just turned 18. 18, a oh boy, you see a pyramid, and what do you do? Climb up it. As I say, it's a boy thing. <laughs> so, I climbed, it's a long way up. And so, I really, I was fit and healthy. So I climbed up to the top of it, not knowing what I would find on the top of the pyramid. But as soon as I got up to the top, it was so obvious, the meaning of the pyramids and the little room, three-sided room with a ceiling on, on the top. Because I travel for three days in the jungle. And if you travel in the jungle in those days, there were just small paths and the jungle was so alive, it's so vibrant. As soon as anybody cut a path through it, the jungle grew over. So you're always traveling, I remember, through these tunnels where you just see the dappled light coming through the, the green canopy of leaves and bushes and vines which covered the whole uh, path, even the river. The point was, for three days, I hadn't seen the horizon, or even the sky. I was going in tunnels. And when I got to the top of one of those pyramids, I realized that those pyramids were so built, they were just above the tree line of the forest. And for the first time in three days, I could see far distances. I could see infinity in all directions around me with nothing blocking me and infinity. And I could also look down at the jungle. And these were of course the days way before Google Maps. And that's what it looked like to me. You could see the path which I'd come that day. And the village in the middle of this lake, I still remember its name, Flores, it's probably a huge metropolis now, but this was 45 years ago, 1969, more than that, 48 years ago. And there I could see it in the distance. It wasn't that far, but it had taken me all day to get there. And when I saw that, I could see just where I'd been and where I'd come from, where I had to go when I left that afternoon or evening all laid out in front of me, the plan of my world. And I realized at that point what it must have been like for someone who'd been living in that jungle all their life. A young man or young girl taking up the top of that pyramid for some religious in initiation. A spiritual awakening to see infinity for the first time, see distance, see the sky, and look down and see the little world in which they lived, to see it with perspective. 
you weren't teaching them theory. It was so obvious they could see it for themselves. But when we're right in front of a screen, we just cannot see the real meaning. We're too close. We're living in a jungle. We don't see distances. We don't get the big picture of what this life is truly all about. Which is one of the reasons. It's not just like looking at screens and being so connected to just the small stuff, the close stuff in front of us. It's also seeing things which are much further away, a much bigger picture, a more universal picture, to see how it all fits in together. And to do that, we have to, every now and again, disconnect. And it's not just disconnecting from devices. Sometimes it's disconnecting from your world. I don't know how many of you my age, he was actually, he was just becoming famous when I started my journey as a monk, Carlos Santana. Apparently he came to Australia recently, when I was in Canberra a couple of days ago, one of the person looking after me were talking about him. And this rock musician, he must be older than me, he must be in his 70s now. How do these guys function? You know, carrying on being a rock star at his age. And apparently when he was interviewed, what he said was something just so smart, so Buddhist, so spiritual. He, he said when he finishes his concert, he leaves Santana on the stage. And he's just an ordinary Joe when he leaves he gets perspective. He's not so close to his role that he can't get separation. He does disconnect from his job, his personality, who he thinks he is. And of course, you not, may not be Carlos Santana, but you also need to disconnect every now and again so that you can get perspective of your life. And you know that once you just get perspective, you disconnect, then it's so easy to see just some of the silly problems of our life, which we worry about, which we fret about, which we don't really need to, which we get angry about. When you're angry, you shout. When you're uh, with a friend, with someone you love, you whisper. Why is that this the case? And the case is that you have to shout when you're angry at the people you live with because psychologically you're distant from them. That's why you have to be shout to be heard. You're distant. But when you have a good relationship with people, when you're close, that's why you only need to whisper to be heard. The whisper is a sign that you are close. Shouting is a sign you've grown distant. Little things like that you can see when the problem's not right in front of you. Which is one of the reasons why we do have retreat centers, we do have monasteries, we do have these pyramids in the jungle of Melbourne, the jungle of your life which is just so intertwined and entangled that we can't see really what's going on, what the problems are. And we just become victims. So we disconnect, turn off, and just take some time out to get to know yourself, be with yourself, and also get to know other people as well. It's always a beautiful, beautiful thing to actually to take that time out to disconnect. You know a lot of times, why do people love you know, watching stupid movies? And they are stupid movies. You know, sometimes I watch movies 
not supposed to, but one of the movies which I watched, I was on an aircraft, this was some years ago, I didn't have any headphones, it just came out right in front of me when those drop down screens. And I'll never forget this movie. It was one of the most funniest movies. I always liked comedy. I was laughing my head off. If you remember the movie, it's called Armageddon. It was one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> when you don't have the sound. <laughs> Try it next time. Some horror movie. So, you know what's going to happen. In this particular movie, I will never forget one of the scenes. I was watching this without any sound, without any commentary, trying to work out what was going on. But apparently, there was a big meteor and it was coming directly towards Earth. It was going to be the end of the world, the Armageddon. And the only way out was just taking just an impossible chance of putting a nuclear bomb on the, on the meteor and blowing it all up. So they had to spend two spacecraft over there. You know, just, and I think Bruce Willis was one of the guys. I forget who the other guy was. And anyway, now I know Bruce Willis because you know, he has the same hairstyle as me. <laughs> and <coughs> So sometimes we get a bit you know, uh, confused at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there you go. You were, they were uh, travelling towards the, the meteor and one of the spacecraft had some misfunction and it smashed into the, into the uh, meteor. And it smashed and there was explosions and sparks and flames for about one or two minutes. And then it fell down this big cliff and then more sparks and explosions and when it all went quiet inside the spacecraft you saw a little hand came up to a ledge and someone, I think Bruce Willis, pulled himself up it wasn't Bruce Willis, it was somebody else, this guy had hair he pulled himself up and his hair was actually perfect <laughs> no. <laughs> Not a strand of hair out of place. No sweat on his face. No soot marks. He survived. <laughs> and I looked at the passenger sitting next to me. There's a, there was this relief written all over his face. Me, I was kidding myself laughing. <laughs> no one can survive anything like that. How dumb and stupid it is. But why do we get involved in that? We get involved in that because we are scared of reality. <coughs> we want to escape, if not into a movie, into playing games on our mobile devices or finding out what the news is. I can tell you what the news is. The news never changes. I've been on this planet 65 years, it's always the same. Politicians lying, <laughs> corruption, everything costing too much and you're never being able to afford it. Sexual scandals, oh people really like to listen to that. Your football team always losing, <laughs> that's always the same, year in, year out. Yes, the names change, the stories stay the same. So I'll tell you what the news is already. You don't need to go and look at it. <laughs> and why do we do that? Why do we want to find out what someone else is up to and doing? Why do we have to keep checking our emails? Honestly, you are not that important. Admit it. <laughs> but we think, oh, we better check just in case. And it never happens. And if it does, you can't do anything about it anyway. So why do we do that? There is no real justification except that we're scared of actually just being. Just being with ourselves. Because you know why? It is because ever since you were small, people told you you're not good enough which means we're always running away because we haven't got a good opinion about her, my, ourselves. 
I did very well at school. You know, I, I, you know, my parents were really poor, and uh, it's actually, I always say legitimately poor. I remember when in the council flat where, my, where I grew up, this was government assisting, not even housing, just a small apartment, really tiny. And I remember when we had a coal fire there to keep warm, and my father or mother, I forget who, put a one pound note on the shelf above the fire. And I don't know how this happened, but a, a breeze of wind took that one pound note and it fell into the fire. And my father just you know, burnt himself trying to get it out, but it was too late. And my mother just burst out crying. This one pound was a huge amount of money to see it just drop into a fire like that for no reason at all. That was just, you know, really hurt them so much. That was a lot of money. So it was, you know, legitimate <coughs> uh, legitimately poor, you know, in those days. But it was uh, obviously a very uh, warm family. I always say because we didn't have much, you know, we actually did interact a lot. And also we had such a small house, there's no way we could escape from one another. And uh, to this day, my mother and father passed away a long time ago. But to this day, my brother, if you see us together, we love each other amazingly well. He became a banker. I became a monk, the opposite ends of the spectrum of life. But nevertheless, to see just how we get on together is amazing. And the reason is because we had to. I shared my 18 years of my life in the same bedroom with him. And I always say to these days, please don't get big houses. Please downsize. Smaller the better. And yeah, you have kids, but don't give them their own rooms. If you give them their own rooms, you never see them. Share rooms. So that your kids can learn how to love one another. And you parents can be so close together, you have to get on. There's no escape. This is not just solving the housing crisis, this solving the getting on with one another crisis, which I think is even more important to learn just how to, to love one another and, and get on with one another. But I did really well at school, always coming top of the class, so I got this scholarship to this really good high school. And from there, got a scholarship to Cambridge. But you know, all the time people were saying, oh, you know, you could do better. But it's coming top of the class. You could do better. <laughs> I don't know how, but... <laughs> so you went to a high school, you can do better, you get your O-levels. Oh, do better, get your A-levels. Do even better, go to university and get sort of the best mark in theoretical physics. Then, go and do better, get a master's. Go and do better, get a PhD. And you all know what I say PhD means. PhD, I shouldn't say this in a university, but here it goes, too late now. <laughs> PhD stands for Permanent Head Damage. <laughs> and that's what's true. But, <laughs> sorry about that guys. <laughs> but, why do you do that for? Because you can always do better. You get a Nobel Laureate. Got another one. Where is this an end? Why do we keep trying to strive to prove ourselves? That's why I'm really against the self-improvement movement. The whole idea of trying to improve yourself. Who said you're not good enough? Who said that? And you believe that? that I'm supposed to be wise. So I tell you, you're all good enough, more than good enough. So just enjoy yourselves. It's other people's problem if they don't think you're good enough. They just don't appreciate you and value you. Like that story I say of this guy who went into a Melbourne bookshop and he asked the receptionist, can you please tell me the way to the self-help section? And she said, if I told you, sir, it would defeat the purpose. It's an obvious one, isn't it? <laughs> so, well, why, 
But this is something which we have in our psyche, whether it's from your mother or your father, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, you're not earning enough money, you know, you could do better. There's no end to that. And that's why we keep escaping. Because we think, if we stop, then what we find out is not good enough. And that's a huge problem in our modern world. And that's why people go into escapism. And that's part of the problem with social media. We're always trying to look somewhere else instead of just being with ourselves. And when you're with yourself and appreciate yourself, it's so much easier to love another person. You love yourself and you can love others very, very easy. And the key story of how you can love yourself, and when you're at peace with yourself, yeah, you can do social media, you don't have to. You can spend more time with yourself because you like being with yourself. And you like being with friends. You're not afraid anymore. You know, a lot of times people, they keep saying, giving a talk in public is the scariest experience in the world. That's why people hate public speaking. And that's why even socialising with someone, just having a cup of coffee, you know, you're afraid. You know, what if I, I, I'm not good enough, or they criticise me? That means a lot of people go escaping, if not into fantasies, into computer games, into just what is now the, uh, the interconnecting. You're not interconnecting with anybody, you're just escaping. You're not connecting, you're escaping. And the simile is, and you can all try this, if you don't think you're good enough, if you think there's something wrong with you, and in particular, if you've had some terrible experience in your life, and you think you're damaged goods, which a lot of people feel, you know, they, please excuse me, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, I think we're only finding the tip of the iceberg, much deeper than that, a lot of people feel they've been damaged. So, one of the great remedies for that is having a walk in a forest. When you walk in the forest, try and find the most beautiful tree. And you will discover the beautiful trees are not the ones which are perfect ones which are dead straight with all the branches in place, with all the leaves green and healthy, with no damage on the trunk, the perfect ones are boring. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, because of you know, who I am, sometimes you do meet these supermodels, beautiful people, so people say, but they're as boring as hell. But, if you go into the forest, you will discover the most beautiful tree, the one you really like, is the one which is bent and crooked. The one with a few branches having been torn off by the storms of life, and in those holes, left by the torn off branches, that's where the animals and the birds make their nests. And the trees with a few yellow leaves and brown leaves to give them some colour, and the, le the trees with all the damage on the bark, they are your favourite trees. The damaged ones are the beautiful ones. So you don't have to be dead straight with everything in place, with no injury or harm in your life to be beautiful. And in fact, if you didn't have those experiences, you would not be one of my favourite trees. So number one, all those difficulties and traumas and damage, number one, it means you belong. You belong in this amazing forest of humanity, of being a human being. 
you belong and in fact you're one of the beautiful ones so for goodness sake don't try and improve yourself don't try and straighten yourself up don't try and, and smooth away all those marks on your trunk the damage of life please never do that you are damaging the beauty who you really are there's another parking meter that's going to be born this time somebody's mobile phone went off so, so when you don't need to improve yourself when you come to the great realization you are good enough in fact you're pretty damn perfect when you can love yourself open the door of yourself to yourself as you are not having to improve at all you're good enough and you really mean that then you find you will not need to have all these escapes the reason why we're always running away somewhere is because we're afraid of what we find if we stay still now when one understands that it becomes so easy to have a good time <laughs> I know sometimes people say Ajahn Brahm it's all right for you you don't live in the real world <laughs> and I say oh come on you're the guys who are not living in the real world I don't color my hair I don't use Botox I don't have breast implants I don't use deodorant as I smell that's who I am <laughs> and sometimes every now and again you go into these shopping malls and you call that the real world that's so fake fake smells, fake lighting, fake um, temperature control why do we have air cons or heaters? that's fake have you noticed people don't have any resilience anymore you know you get cold it's lovely being cold you get hot, oh, it's too hot, turn on the air con don't you remember when you were young you go out playing and it was hot, it was cold you get wet no one even gets wet anymore they wear umbrellas, raincoats when I was a kid you'd get soaked to the skin and you'd enjoy it you'd get all muddy playing soccer or even playing in the snow you play snowballs, get it down your neck that was always the best place to hit it, just run the back here, just go around the neck <laughs> you are alive, yeah you got cold and sometimes you had colds, a bit of flu but that was important for life why do we try and escape from life now? so much so that I've been telling a lot of people, I probably told this last time what's wrong with being sick? I'm going to start a society, sick people's rights you've got a right to be sick, so much so if, any, well if you actually say doctor there's something wrong with me, I'm sick never say that, stop stigmatizing sickness there's nothing wrong with being sick next time you go and see a doctor you've got the flu or you're dying please tell them doctor there's something right with me <laughs> I'm sick again, it's normal it's your right to be sick and don't get people to stigmatize it imagine if that happened we take away the fear of sickness we take it as part of life it's no big deal or even what I've been focusing on recently why is it a stigma to be wrong? that's stupid we're all wrong sometimes I am wrong a lot of the time and I maintain my right as a very famous Buddhist teacher to be wrong I didn't mind my right, so don't take that away from me, okay? And I love being wrong. When I'm wrong, I usually share it with other people. Like I was doing uh, last night, Friday night in Nolabar, saying all the times I was wrong. I think one of the stories I said when I was wrong, lots of Sri Lankans here. There was a Sri Lankan student, one of his parents died. He said, can you please do the funeral ceremony? 
And I said, yeah, sure. And they did tell me the name, but you know, I, I know a little bit of Sri Lankan culture, the Buddhist, but, but your names, I don't know what's a female name, what's a male name. So that when I went to the funeral parlor to actually to, you know, to do the funeral, you know, I said, we've all come here today on the sad occasion of, you know, my friend, uh, the, the young man of his uh, mother who's passed away. And it's such a sad thing, we're going to do this ceremony for the mother and Buddhist way. And that's when this old woman stood up at the front. She stood right up and said, it's not me who's dead, <laughs> it's my husband, he passed away. <laughs> I had a 50-50 chance and I blew it. That was such a memorable funeral, that was. <laughs> oh, marriages. I told this other story. <laughs> Just to make it sort of multicultural, there was this young Thai girl. You know, she was about 2021, 20, but she looked about 16. And she came into the ceremony, you know, she was led in by this man, and I thought, oh, you know, you are deputizing for her father. And he looked at me with just such dagger, such anger. He said, I am not the father, I am the groom. <laughs> and that was the end of any donations for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, doesn't it make you real when you make mistakes? What's wrong with making mistakes? So why do we hide it? Why can't the treasurer of our Australia say you made a mistake? Because <laughs> you won't allow him, will you? And it's the same with each one of you. Please allow yourself to make mistakes. Then you don't make so many. And when you make a mistake, you tell everyone about it, they laugh, it makes it human. There's nothing wrong with that. So when you understand what life actually is, and you accept it, you open the door of your heart to it, we won't need to escape anymore. Life is too much fun, too much enjoyable to actually to go escaping into social media and Facebook. Why is it that people like even to date on Facebook or is it Tinder? <laughs> now, if you're wondering, how does Ajahn Brahm know that? Is he looking for a partner in life? <laughs> is he dating? Is he fed up with being a monk? No, I read all these articles, you know, on the, on the newspapers, on the aircraft. So, why do people have to do that? Why can't they just go up and, and talk to one another? You know why? It's because, oh, what's she going to think of me? What's he going to think of me? We're just so unconfident because we've always been put down since we were small. No one really sort of praises us. And look, look at the way you parents, stand back a bit, like getting up the pyramid, and look at the way you talk to your children. How many times in one day do you praise your kid? And how many times in a day do you tell them off? See if you can imagine what your children are hearing the parents saying about them. Room's not tidy enough. Do your homework. Too much time on the computer. Just, you, Grades are not good enough. You're spending too much time. How many times do you actually praise your kids? So what do your kids hear? What do the kids hear is they're not good enough. They're always doing stuff wrong. Those of you who have a relationship and want to keep it going, how many times do you hear your wife say, you're late? <laughs> how many times do you hear criticism? And how many times do you appear do you hear appreciation? If you want your relationship to flourish, please, seven, seven appreciations, seven words of praise to every word of criticism. Not the other way around. If you want your children to do well, build them up emotionally, give them a self get a sense of confidence and self-worth. You are good enough. You're more than good enough. I really appreciate that, you know, your, your room is not uh, as dirty. 
as the toilet in Melbourne railway station. <laughs> so, so build them up. And when they've got the sense of self-worth, and they realise they're okay, then perhaps they won't be escaping from themselves so much. They can be switched on to their okay people, that they can do whatever they like in life and be successful and be happy in so many different ways of life. And they can actually go and talk to people without people putting them down and criticising them. They can actually find nice relationships because other people will actually appreciate, you know, when they make those advances and say, would you like to go out tonight? With you? No way! Oh, don't do stuff like that. Now, do something which is nice and kind. Build people up so they can engage. And if you are a boss at work, for goodness sake, if you want to get productivity out of your workforce and get the rise, that's what I, look, I'm very good at getting productivity. Look how many people come to my talks. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, it's not happened yet, but it's coming out any day now. The results of the census last year, the 2016 census. Remember, I'm a Buddhist leader. So if the number of Buddhists in Australia don't improve, I'll get the sack. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> reached my sales targets. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty okay. I think I'll get a bonus this year. <laughs> <laughs> but, but whatever. That's not what you're in this game for. But what you really are trying to do is to make people feel happy in their own skin. So praise one another, appreciate one another. And if you appreciate one another, you can appreciate yourself. And all this escapism, it's not just escaping into, into all these uh, social media. It's escaping into addictions. This is another form of addiction. Ice. Why do kids take ice? It's the only time they really feel good. They feel confident when they've got these chemicals rushing through their systems. Why do they take other drugs to escape? Why do people go to the bar and take, take alcohol? Why? I don't know if you heard last Friday night, I said this um, over in, this was actually in Perth in Northbridge, there's one of these really big bikies, you know, who opened up a bar. And in that bar they had a competition. Because the biker was this huge guy, the owner of the bar. And when he made a drink for someone, if they needed any sort of um, lemon, this owner would actually squeeze the lemon, you know, to make whatever they wanted to drink. And he was so tough, there was a competition if anybody could take that lemon, once it's been squeezed by the owner in a, a bikey, once he could, if anyone could get three drops out of that, that lemon, they'd get free drinks for the whole night. Many people tried that. You know, these big sort of weightlifters, professional wrestlers, they all tried this, but no one, no one could get even one drop after this, this ex-bikey bar owner squeezed the lemon. Until one day this, this little guy came in, only about five foot six, in a nice suit and tie, really thin. He said, I want to have a go. He said, look, forget it, it's a waste of time. No, I want to have a go. And so the bartender said, okay. You know, the bartender squeezed this lemon and just squeezed it so hard that all the juice came out. And then he gave it to this guy in a suit, this thin guy, small guy. And this guy took that lemon, and he squeezed it, and he squeezed it, and he squeezed it. You know what? A drop came out. He squeezed it more, and another drop. Squeezed it some more, four or five other drops came out. And everyone in the bar was taken aback. How on earth do you do that? Who the heck are you? And he said, I'm Mr. Morrison, the treasurer of the Australian government. I can squeeze... <laughs> I can squeeze more out of you guys. 
That's a topical joke. <laughs> so. <laughs> but, but when you like yourself, and you, you don't try and squeeze things out of people, you get much more out of them when you don't squeeze them. You inspire them. And so a lot of times I go in business seminars, modern businesses, to actually to get productivity, you've got to get people working together. So on the flight over here this morning, it was, people asked me, how was your flight? It was actually was not a comfortable flight from Perth uh, here to Melbourne, because in that uh, flight, there was the Western Bulldogs returning. They lost to the Eagles. <laughs> and these were huge guys. And there was one sitting next to me. And I was so squashed. And I, I didn't dare complain. It's a big guy. Don't know what you might do to me. <laughs> but, so, there you are in life. But, why is it the only reason why those footballers, I looked at them, how they were interacting with one another, no one was telling them off for losing. They weren't sort of uh, forcing or criticising one another. They just you know, came close but had a bad game. Like we all do sometimes. And I saw just the friendship which they had together, the cooperation in that plane. You know, going, talking to one another, making sure everyone was okay. That is how to run a company. Not somebody telling you what to do, but inspiring you how to do it. And then people will not need to want to escape after a hard day's work. They go and they won't need to want to escape from their, their family. This is actually how we stop all these addictions. When people are happy with their lives, they get appreciation then they don't need to have addictions. And one of those addictions, again, is social media. And my addiction is, I talk too much. <laughs> and I've just been told by someone to wind up. So thank you all for listening. I hope it was useful. If it wasn't, tough luck. <laughs> Very good. Okay, questions. Thank you, Ajahn Brown, for your wonderful sense of humour about this evening and your pearls of wisdom. Um, I think we're all encouraged now that Adam's slide and switch on and also to re-watch Armageddon. Which <laughs> <laughs> we're going to stand up here. So we've come to the question and answer session of the evening. Please, please raise your hand if you have a question and the volunteers will come around with a microphone. Uh, we also have a couple of other lecture theatres where pe people are seated. seated. Oh, really? Um, Hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, we have runners who are volunteers, so they'll be writing down your question, coming into the, um, this lecture theatre and running back and forth. So, who'd like to ask a question? Have I done Brown? Anything at all? Yes, in the back. This oh, in right the back. back. Yes. On the right side. Very good. Uh, my question is: You almost make imperfection a virtue while you were describing it. Exactly. And, and I quite agree with that. But on the other note, I find that many a times relationships break because two people are always pointing to imperfection. Yeah. And it doesn't exist. Look, a lot of times people actually come and say, I can't stand my husband any longer. I want to get divorced and find another one. And I tell them, I know this, husbands are all the same. <laughs> so you get rid of this one and get another one. It's all the same. There's no slight differences, but you know, just pretty much the same. And the same you guys, if you're fed up with this girl, you want to get another one. They're exactly the same. Different chassis, but same engine. <laughs> and that is so true. So stick with the one you've got. You've had such an investment with her or him. You know, you've had so many wonderful experiences together. You've got to know one another and understand one another. That's good enough. And why just... All that hard work, you know, of finding a partner, getting to know them, 
and uh, trying to actually to fit in with them. Why just throw that away? All those wonderful years. But of course what happens, so many people tell me, they don't feel they're appreciated or valued. And that's the thing about all this criticism business. And to me it's, you know, these are two people I've known for a long time, they come up, they can't stand one another. So I can stand you, you're really a good, wonderful woman. I really appreciate you. I can see all your goodness and your kindness and generosity and you're a great guy. I've known you since you were small. Now why on earth can't you get together? You're really high quality people. I can see the goodness but there comes a time where we can't see that in one another because we spent too much time pointing out each other's faults. You know the first story in my first book, The Two Bad Bricks in a War, I'll repeat that very quickly for you because that's a powerful story. When I first came to Australia, into Perth, uh, we didn't have any money. I had to learn how to build because we couldn't afford a builder. Now, a theoretical physicist, you know, into the astrophysics of the galaxy, you know, quantum mechanics, that's what I really got into. And now I had to mix concrete <laughs> and lay sewer pipes and, and lay bricks. And laying bricks was the hard part. Every brick had to be perfect until I moved on to the next one. And after I built my first brick wall, that's, it was amazing. I still don't know how I missed those two bricks. <laughs> I looked back and these two bricks were crooked. All the rest were, were nice and even. And those two crooked bricks spoiled the whole wall. They spoiled it. So much so that my response, my reaction was, can we get a bulldozer and push it over so I can start again? I even suggested to the other monk who was there at the time, can we afford to buy some dynamite? I want to blow it up. I wanted to destroy that wall because those two bad bricks spoiled it. And honestly, for three months I suffered. I had nightmares. You wake up in the middle of the night, my mistakes. Why did I do that? Everyone could see it. And after three months, I was with a gentleman who was visiting. They saw that wall. They said it was a beautiful wall. And I said to him, I remember this. I said, are you blind? <laughs> Can't you see those two bad bricks? And what he said next was so important. And I shared this with hundreds of thousands of people. He said, yes, I can see those two bad bricks, the two crooked ones, but I can also see the 998 perfect ones as well. And what happened was, that was the first time in three months I could see the perfect bricks. For three months, every time I even passed that wall, my eyes would automatically go to the mistakes. It's just seeing the mistakes, that's all. When I thought of it, I thought of the mistakes. When I dreamt of it, I dreamt of the mistakes. And this guy said, he wasn't blind, I was a blind one. And I realized it's not just in walls. So much of my life, if someone uh, abused me, you can't be my friend anymore. A business partner let me down. Right, that's it. One bad brick and I wanted to destroy relationships. And you all know that many suicides happen because a kid at university, they don't get the grades they expect or the uh, relationship breaks down. One little bad brick in their life, maybe a big brick, and they want to destroy the wall, blow it up, suicide. Because they can't see the 998 good bricks. So, you're not saying people are perfect. Every wall has got two bad bricks. But, there's no need to destroy it. When you understand that, people are beautiful, not perfect, but beautiful. And when I gave that story, I gave that story a lot to the cancer group over in Western Australia. That's when a builder came up to me and he completed the story for me. He said, I'm in the building industry. All bricklayers make mistakes. They all do. So don't feel bad about your two crooked bricks. But, he said, in the building industry, when one of our tradespeople make a mistake like that, we tell our clients it's a feature 
how we charge them a few extra thousand dollars for it. <laughs> Not only is that true, but it's beautiful. Your mistakes, your imperfections, they're your features which make you lovable. Those are the marks on the tree which make you my favourite tree. So that's a brilliant story. So please, don't ever get rid of imperfections. We've been striving to do that, it just makes us so stressed out. Celebrate imperfections. Yay! Yeah. What is the method you would suggest to us to get rid of the social media addiction in day-to-day -day life? The method. Okay, the method, you can try one of the very simple methods that I was taught. Every morning when you get out of bed and you go to the toilet, maybe after you've relieved yourself, when you're washing your hands, please look in the mirror get your two fingers out and push up, <laughs> smile at yourself. I did that for two years, I ended up laughing. And sometimes, those of you who had your photographs taken with me for one hour, how can you manage to keep smiling for one hour? Training, that's what it is, training. <laughs> and I train every morning. <laughs> So, what that does is you look at yourself and you feel good about yourself. Now, it's such a simple way to overcome just the average depressions of life. Really big depressions, you, know, you need to maybe go and see a, a psychologist, see your doctor. But most times, when you get a bit fed up in life, just go up and just smile at yourself and laugh at yourself. And that means that you get a very good, happy relationship with yourself. And from that you'll find it's so easy to have a happy relationship with other people. And from that, the need for addictions such as social media starts to disappear. Your fear of interaction face to face starts to disappear. You don't need social media. Very good, okay. Uh, hi Ajahn, um, my question is regarding karma. So, um, in the sense that we don't have to improve ourselves, what about in relation to karma? So, should we learn to improve our habits so that we can cultivate good karma? Exactly, improve your habits by accepting yourself as you are. Improve your good karma by learning how to love the other people around you. It's like what we call like um, one of the most powerful uh, parts of karma. Is our intention is kindness and compassion. And sometimes people actually ask, tell me, like before I left Perth, Ajahn Brahm, have a nice flight. And I say, no, I will not be controlled by anybody. That is not compassion, that's control. And so I tell them, if you really love somebody and you want to make good karma, you just tell them, have a wonderful flight if you want to, but it's not necessary. If you want to have a miserable <laughs> flight, that is up to you. And when somebody visits someone who's sick in hospital, you don't say, oh, may you get better. That really puts a lot of psychological pressure on someone who's sick. They have to get better just because you told them to. So when you go and see your, your old mother in hospital and she's you know, really, really sick with the flu or something, please say, Mom, you can get better if you want, but you don't have to. I will love you whichever way it goes. Just relax and see what happens. Take away the pressure. Now that's kindness. <laughs> so sometimes what people think is kindness is just more control. I want you to get better to make me feel happy. Okay, go on. I'll just read another one out from the other lecture theatre. Besides the usual methods of giving by effort or material, how can one develop or generate merit? Does meditation generate merit or only wisdom alone? 
that's how you generate wisdom. What meditation is, is like, is climbing up the pyramid, leaving this world, getting outside of the box so you can see outside of the box. Because we're just so engrossed in this world. We need to actually have some distance. That's what happens when your mind gets so peaceful and so still. It's a wisdom born of silence, not through thinking. You know, there was another university in Melbourne. I won't say, you know, what its name is, but it's not this one, but it gives, begins with M-O-N. <laughs> and I saw their adverts. They're trying to get some more people coming in. And they said, you know, if you think you know, think again. Or something like that. And that's so stupid. <laughs> if you think you know, stop thinking. Because when people have the idea they're going to get new knowledge, innovation, true thinking, it's just like harvesting a field which has been harvested so many times. It's like going in an old mine trying to get more ore out of that mine. It's been mined and mined and mined. How about going to a new body of ore, a new field, and harvesting that? Innovation is very rare in this world. We just keep going over old areas. I know in physics, when was the last big breakthrough in physics? We're just going over old stuff again and again and again. The last big breakthrough was quantum theory, and that was in the 1950s. There hasn't been any major shift, new discoveries, new ways of looking at stuff. And that's because we're taught to think rather than to see. And if you want to know what I mean, this is how I taught the innovators. I get to go to some really good gigs these days. Anything which is weird, which I, where I don't belong, that's where I usually go to. This was in uh, South Korea, in Daejeon, I was a keynote speaker at this major international conference. The keynote speaker is after all the introductions are done by the presidents and stuff, this is to set the tone for the whole conference. And this was a 2015 World Computer Congress. <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about when you say disconnect and get switched on. This was to all the high executives of obviously Google and uh, face it was Facebook there, but you know Samsung and LG and stuff. I held up a bottle of water, and I asked all of these great professors, "What is it I'm holding up?" And they said, "Bottle of water. What else? Plastic. What else? Half full. What else? Half empty. That's an old one. What else? Blue. What else? Maybe about eight inches high. Cylindrical. What else?" What else? What else? There's no right answer. Don't think that you can get a right answer and say, yes, you've got it, you've won the prize. No. The longer you look, the deeper you see. Anyone who thinks this is a bottle of water, then you won't look any further. You think you've known. And you put it aside and go into something else. Keep on looking until you run out of thoughts, of labels. Everything you've ever been taught at school or university, what this is, you exhaust that first. And then once you run out of the labels, you can actually start to see maybe what this is. What it can be used for. That's innovation. Not thinking, but exhausting thoughts. So you have some silence. And that's where innovation comes from. That is what universities should be doing. Going beyond thought, the wisdom born of silence. Thank you, Ajahn Ram. We have another question from the audience. Oh, right yeah. Hopefully you can hear me. Thank you, Ajahn Yeah. Um, I just want to say,
say, how do you know if you're doing the right thing by your kids? Uh, <laughs> how do you know you're doing the right thing by your kids? You come to the expert here because <laughs> I've never been married, never had kids. <laughs> Yeah, very good. But one thing again, living outside the box, doing right by your kids. Look, it's a great little book by uh, Daniel Goldman, Emotional Intelligence. It's getting good grades, or even going to university. That's in interesting, but it's not essential, as you all know. The emotional intelligence is paramount. They feel good inside themselves. They're confident, they're happy. Whether they come top or they go to university, I know many crazy people at Cambridge. They had Nobel Prizes, but they were depressed, had no idea of who they were and what life was all about. That's one of the reasons I left that place. They were intelligent in theoretical physics, but stupid in life, honestly. You know, I'm still well connected. You know, I once went to dinner with Sir Roger Penrose. He's the guy who did black holes. And to me, you know, he was probably more of an innovator than Stephen Hawkins. To me, that Stephen Hawkins was piggybacking on Roger Penrose's work. You know, to me, he's probably the greatest physicist alive today. So I had the good fortune of, I didn't eat anything, just went there to see the guy. <laughs> and you try to have a conversation with him, but he was socially inept. He was famous. I tried to engage him, but after a couple of minutes, you know, he couldn't carry on a conversation. And after about half an hour, I was sitting next to somebody from NASA, having a really interesting conversation. And I saw him just standing against the wall, the wallflower. No one was engaging with him at all. And this is one of the problems. Emotional intelligence, where you have friends. Would you suggest um, to be plugged in or not plugged in for children? I know, just to keep uh, supporting them, keep praising them, keep knowing that they're cared for and they're loved. Get that confidence growing in them so they can actually talk to one another. Spend a lot of time training them by talking to them. Sometimes we think kids don't listen. They do hear what you say, only they just don't admit it. Very good. Some exercise. Come on, faster, 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 faster. Okay, it's one over there. Uh, hello. Here. Yes. Okay. And I'd like to ask uh, how to get rid of this fear of being rejected and excluded? Ah, uh, yeah. But that is. If, if a mother has it, and then. We don't know, I don't know how to teach my daughter. Or yeah. Yes, so I like to help myself first. Yeah, exactly. And the, if you're afraid of being rejected and excluded, what you're afraid of you usually make happen. So this is one of the problems with fear. We create the future through fear. So when we have the confidence, you know, which is put in as, give it a try, go for it, you can do anything. It's like the fear of failure, and failure is regarded as a personal fault in us. So we never try anything because we're afraid of failure. For me, failure is an important part of life like sickness. I support failure <laughs> instead of success. Because it's failure is where we learn. It was my 70% rule. When I was a school teacher, I asked one of my, I had to set an examination. How do you set exams? I was never giving any training. And this very wise teacher said, see if you can set the math test so the average score is about 7 out of 10, 70%. If it's too easy, they all get 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. It's a useless exam. If it's too hard, they only get 3 or 4 out of 10. They will all come out thinking they cannot do maths. They feel they have failures. 70% is a reasonably good score.
But the 30% where they make mistakes, that's even more important for me as their teacher to find out what they haven't understood, their weak points, so in the next lessons I can address those. The mistakes are where we learn in life. The successes, we don't learn anything. The failures, that's where we can find out our weak points and just actually do something about it. So, never look at giving it a try and it not working out as a personal weakness. It's not trying, it's a weakness. And eventually you get there. Rejection. Look, there's so many people feel rejected, but there's so many people just waiting to make friends with you. Waiting to go out with you, waiting to sort of, to connect with you. We've got so many isolated people in this world. Why can't they connect together? Afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of failure? It's not rejection. And so please, if, you know, never reject anybody else. Never reject the bent trees, the crooked trees. There's so many people in this world, I'm talking about you know, the people who have got some physical disability or um, emotional disability like a schizophrenia or um, ADD or something, they feel so rejected. But fortunately these days, instead of putting them in institutions, these people are actually the same as us, they, they go to the same schools, they're in the same classes, they're integrated, accepted. So, you should never ever reject a person. But instead of rejection, respect one another. Look, I'm going to be really going a little bit you know, further than I would think now, but one of the problems with terrorism is many of the Muslims feel they are rejected. Not accepted, not expect accepted. And they've gone to this point where you know, they're living up to our fears. For goodness sake, you know, we've created that problem. And so the solution is, please respect one another. And when we respect one another, we don't reject people. We, that's where integration happens. We learn from one another. You know, I learn from a lot of people who are so different than me. Even just recently, I make a point of actually hanging out with people of different religions. Just only a week ago, we were with the Catholic Benedictine monks. Oh, really great friends. Hang out with Anglicans. One of my favorite Jewish men, Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Bernstein, he's a good mate. He, uh, but I like the rebels, <laughs> the ones who think differently, who can question. And there we get amazing sort of growth. So, don't reject anybody. Have you ever felt rejected? And how terrible it feels? Don't ever do that to anybody else. Anyway, that's, I'm just going off on, on a tangent there. Thank you for your question. Um, this one from the other lecture, you know, I'll just read out. Oh, yeah. How do we set a standard for ourselves of how much income we need? Okay. How do we find the balance between trying to get better financially and have a good quality of life? Okay. Trying to get a higher income. If you are working for a promotion at work, please figure it out. Haven't you got enough stress already? So, getting a promotion means more stress. But you get more money. But, doesn't matter how much money you get, it's always not enough. So, better than not enough you have now, with less stress, than not enough you have later on when you get the promotion. <laughs> Crazy people. And you don't need that much to survive, downsize your house. People just say how hard it is for young people to get started in the housing market. Why don't we either have smaller houses, which actually people are actually doing now, or even better, you know, two or three families buying one house. Being a family. This is nothing new. I remember 
for one of the most beautiful memories I have of going to northeast Thailand 43 years ago I was going into one of the villages they didn't have electricity just dirt roads and you had the water buffalo were on the lower level and they had an open area on the top they used oil, kerosene a uh, bowl of kerosene and they used a toothpaste tube the top which they put a rag in for the wick very smoky but enough light the smoke was there to get rid of the mosquitoes and you'd see house after house a semicircle of family members grandparents, uncles, aunties, brothers and sisters, children all sitting together, about 16 or 17 in every house they're telling old stories, ghost stories every night talking to one another and you could see their faces by the, the orange glow of the, 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 lamp, the lamp and I looked at that and I thought how deprived I was only having a mother, father and one brother in my house and having a TV so we never actually talked to one another and I looked at that and I thought how beautiful that was and how inexpensive how about just having many families in one house much cheaper can't we get on together? we have arguments but through the arguments, we learn how to love one another. So little things like that, maybe that's the solution. So you don't need that much money then. And when you don't have so much money, not so much stress. Simple. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which we speak, the yeah. lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And yeah. pay my respects to them, past, present, and emerging. Their Very good. And also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'd agree with the view that you're advocating about the personal acceptance and unplugging and taking a uh, broader view of the world. However, there are some imperfections that seem too oppressive for one to accept, like Scott Morrison. <laughs> There are those with power that cause so much pain in this world. And in order to prevent these messed up things from happening, you would surely have to engage for one to advocate to um, advocate for one to engage with political issues and to act to, pr to protect our fellow humans. So does not this view uh, mean we have to Engage, plug in and act. Engage, plug in and act. Engage, yes. Just on Wednesday, I was in Federal Parliament, Parliament House, trying to engage with as many senators as possible. It was our WASAC day. And you realise that there's a lot which some of this philosophy can actually add and improve upon our world, like one suggestion I've been making for many years and after the last federal election that somebody did an article on this in the Melbourne Age why do we always have to accept democracy as it is and not to improve upon it and my suggestion was quite reasonable and logical that if there is a company the more shares you have in the company, the more investment you have in it, the more votes you have. That's reasonable. If you're in some sort of organisation, you've only so invested ten dollars, why should you have the same vote as if you invested a thousand dollars? We all accept that. But why in democracy does everybody have the same vote? when some people have not got the same investment so I wanted to have younger people having a much greater vote
because people like Scott Morrison will not live that long to see what happens to his policies as long as an 18-year-old will live. So I thought that life expectancy, that will give a weight to your vote. So the people who will have to live with the consequences of our government's decisions longer will have a greater say. It would be very interesting to see if someone who is say 60 or 65 like me had far less of a vote than someone who is 20 or 23. I don't know how old you are, sir, but I think you are younger than me. <laughs> so you are going to live with the consequences of climate change much more than I am. You should have more say. So little things like that, putting them out there, who knows where it will end up. And the other thing which I often say in elections, the word candidate comes from the Latin word candid, meaning white. Because that was the colour which uh, people standing for the Senate in Rome had to wear as a sign of their virtuous conduct in the past. That's where we get the word candidate from. And it was expected in Rome that you were elected on your past conduct not on your promises for the future. And today, whoever promises the most, or otherwise lies the most convincingly, are the ones who get elected. Can't we sort of change just the culture of democracy so people are elected on their past conduct, not on any future promises? We get a higher quality of politicians. And number two, when they do make mistakes, please don't throw them out straight away. We all make mistakes. We learn from them, we grow from them, and do better next time. So there's little things you can do to engage with people. But I'm very concerned about social media being abused being just another means to control human beings. It's a danger. Try and keep it independent if you possibly can. Free. But how do we check its veracity? Mainstream media in the past, at least you could take them to court if they lied. Sometimes they get away with it. But current media, sometimes I don't know who's telling the truth, who isn't. And there's no way I can check it out. That's where you get terrorism. People actually believe the narrow band of messages they receive on social media. It is a problem. But anyway, there are solutions. So let's find those solutions. I just, throwing ideas up like that is just, who knows? It managed to get in the Melbourne age. So that's an influential paper. Maybe we can go further. Democracy is great, but it can be improved. Why just keep doing the same thing just because it's tradition? Improve it. Make it better. Anyway, that's just my sort of contribution. Many thanks, Ajahn Ram, for, and to all of you for attending and making this a wonderful evening. And also for coming all the way from WA, Ajahn, it's a long trip. Very good.